But uh, I have to mention this again. It's the No State Project for May 22nd, 2019. Uh, I, I, just one of those things. I'm out of town and I forgot to put uh, my audio on. So anyway, uh, welcome back to the No State Project. It's only on my YouTube channel. Uh, if you're hearing this on LRN, it's not live, so do not call in. The call number is 218-632-9399, 218-632-9399. The passcode is 2020 if you are watching the live stream on my YouTube channel. And so what I was mentioning is that uh, Nelson up in Maine sent me this regarding the ruling class and how the rules just don't apply. And, and, and it doesn't help that they try to make it look good. I mean, it's all about public relations, right? So uh, the headline is, I'll I'll get this in I I'll have to get this into the uh, the show notes. Uh, but what I'll do is I will copy and paste this link in to the Skype chat, not Skype, YouTube, so you guys can follow along with me over there. District Attorney drops misdemeanor charges against former Maine lawmaker. Former Republican State Representative Jeffrey Pierce was charged with failing to disclose a 1983 felony conviction when he obtained a hunting license. Yeah, so the district attorney, Natasha Irving, this is in Augusta, it's Lincoln County, uh, dismissed misdemeanor charges, there were more than, more than one charge, against a former state lawmaker who failed to disclose a felony conviction when he obtained a hunting license. Irving said she did not believe she had enough evidence to guarantee a conviction against former rep Jeffrey Pierce, a Republican from Dresden, in a jury trial, and as she was not inclined to spend taxpayer funds to proceed. Oh, isn't that nice of her? Oh, Miss Irving over here. Oh, that. Oh, it warms my heart. Irving, a Democrat, also said her office wanted to treat Pierce like any other person who was facing similar charges and that prosecutors had more serious cases to pursue. Pierce faced three counts of fraudulently obtaining a hunting license, a Class E misdemeanor punishable by up to six months in jail and a thousand dollar fine. He pleaded guilty to the charges in March in Lincoln County District Court and requested a jury trial. Well, let's talk about this. Uh, she says uh, they, her office wanted to treat Pierce like any other person who was facing similar charges and that prosecutors had more serious cases to pursue. I unfortunately have some personal, uh, personal contact with uh, these prosecutors in Maine. And uh, I got to go ahead and disagree with Miss Irving here. If you wanted to treat him like everybody else, you would have prosecuted him. You would have, one, opposed any, any, any chance that he would have a jury anyway since it's less than a year. But even so, if you, okay, uh, I work with somebody who was from Russia. And as a student, they, they were going to school uh, in Maine. Uh, this is in ba uh, Bear Harbor. I want to be able to say that correctly there. It's in the Bear Harbor and Bar Harbor for those not from the Northeast. So, made a, a mistake, did something they shouldn't have done, stole a $2 or so bottle of, uh, a bar of soap. I don't remember the exact reason. Maybe it was just a kid, you know, a kid being stupid, you know. Uh, but bottom line, she stole a, a bar of soap. Uh, she did not stick around Maine for the prosecution, and she had pretty good reason to expect that she would not be treated fairly. I would imagine someone who grew up most of the, you know, spent most of their life in Russia with no fair trials. Uh, it, it, it's just public relations. It, it, it doesn't mean anything. You, you're going to get convicted. And... Years later, she want, you know, she had contacted me to help get this resolved because uh, there was a warrant in the United States and she would not be able to fly into North America, let's say, without getting picked up on that warrant. So we tried to get it, the warrant quashed. Every, I, I've reported about this. Every single thing we put in was denied. 
I'll give them this much. When we file the petition uh, for a writ into the uh, the appellate court, uh, the appellate court declined to take jurisdiction and gave the filing fee back. So, holy crap on that. Uh, I have never heard of a court giving a filing fee back. Uh, I know when we work with Mike in Idaho, and there was an attorney involved, we had filed a uh, to get a, 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 to get a written interlocutory appeal to stop his traffic his uh, tax uh, prosecution. Uh, I think it was a four hundred and fifty dollar filing fee, and they refused to take jurisdiction, and they kept the filing fee. So uh, that, that's what they're saying. So that's what I, it's, you know, the, why the, one of the things why this case stands out so much to me, why it's easy to remember that. Um, he, the judge absolutely refused. We tried to change the judge. They denied it. We couldn't maintain any kind of writ. So uh, to review that, so the offer, offer was made to just pay the pay a fine. Pay a fine. Just like this guy did. He paid a fine, and they dropped the. He he paid seven hundred. He he donated the seven hundred and fifty. He would have been fined to a conservation organization in Maine. Yeah, he could have and should have went to jail. So here, uh, someone is offering to pay a fine to have it be, just you know, to have it be to have the warrant taken care of, and to have the the matter settled. Again, we're talking about a a, a value and controversy of less than five bucks. And the prosecution and the judge absolutely refused. The prosecution, it, let's leave the judge out of it. The prosecutor wouldn't go for it. The prosecutor wanted them back in Maine and, and had to take care of the warrant before any discussion on a deal would be made. So I'm calling BS right here, Irving. You don't want to treat them like everybody else because everybody else who's not a, a bureaucrat, a part of the ruling class, everybody else, you throw the book at them. And I have I have at least one anecdote to show that that is true. The former lawmaker would not confirm the agreement in an interview Monday saying it was between him and the district attorney's office. He said he was the target of a politically motivated witch hunt, and the quotes are from the article. And that he would now ask a judge to restore all of his rights and privileges as a citizen, including the right to possess a firearm. He was also convicted of felony-level drug trafficking in 1983 for selling cocaine and marijuana to an undercover state trooper. So, yeah, I guess he wasn't a lawmaker at that time. Maybe they they they, they didn't realize we got a future member of the ruling class here maybe we should uh we should maybe we should not uh do that uh tom audio smoothed out but still getting some static here and there ah i i, I i'm lucky to even be doing a show here today yeah at home bumming it uh what horse crap uh what does he got here uh but yeah they, they, yeah they, Eight months on, yeah, but they'll waste eight months on annual. Yeah, of course. When it's one of the little people, when it's one of the plebes, they throw the book at you. If you do not enter a plea of of, of guilty and pay a fine, we're going to have to bring you to a jury trial. We're going to have to throw the book at you. We are going to have to charge you up and down. Everything. No, for this guy... I uh, I don't know if I can if I could who if I could guarantee. First of all, what prosecutor actually says you know uh, as a matter of procedure? I guarantee a a, a conviction. Guarantee. Oh, so that's the that's that's what they they have to guarantee. They have to be they have to be able to guarantee. A conviction before they bring you to trial. Does anyone think for a second that's the way prosecutors think? Maybe what they should have done was knock it down to a traffic offense and then really nail his butt to the wall. Because traffic court judges couldn't give a damn. They don't give a damn about this. So again, we got my friend in Russia. 
$5 in controversy, $5, would not settle. So please, ruling class, the rules, different set of rules. Irving, a Democrat, also said her office wanted to treat Pierce like any other person who is facing similar charges. Prosecutors had more serious cases to pursue. Yeah, a bar of soap prosecution. Please. Oi, they over here. Anyway, if you want to join me here on the big show today, you may do so at 218-632-9399. 218-632-9399. The passcode is 2020. And, uh, had an interesting conversation with some very, very nice woman with, uh, it's a tax agency. And, uh, well, I, I'm, it, it involves a tax issue. And I called and spoke to a very nice woman. I am not going to be disparaging her based on the phone call. Um, I think she was so kind and professional and so happy go lucky. I don't think she's going to be the actual commissioner that I'm going to be dealing with which is really unfortunate because I get a really nice woman and get a really good admission and mo most likely she's, she's just going to have to pass it off to another commissioner because that's not, it's not, her, the property is not in her district. The good thing is she's the chair, she's the chair of the, of the commission. So she's got her own district, but she's still the chairman, the chairwoman. And, uh, you know, someone's saying, what's more serious to a DA than BS convictions? You got that right. But hey, he's a former, he's a lawmaker. He's a part of the ruling class. So, you know, hey. Yeah, their resources, yeah, they are limitless. And they keep collecting a paycheck no matter how long it takes. Yeah. When are they concerned? Oh, I don't, the taxpayer. It's just like impeaching uh, Captain Cheeto. We don't want to be divisive. We don't want to be... Every excuse not to hold a member of the of, of the ruling class accountable. It's this uh, divisive. Oh, oh, yes, but putting children in cages. Oh, that's not divisive. There's so many other things that are divisive. I, but, 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 but stopping him, no, no we're not going to do that. If you and I steal a bar of soap. No, not even not even something where there's a victim. If you and I just don't get a driver's license, you can be certain you will be convicted most of the time, and you will do time. In fact, if you don't have a driver's license in some places, you will stay in jail pending the prosecution. I remember years ago someone saying to me about Tent City up uh, out in Phoenix, you know, and, and, and with uh, uh, Joe Arpaio. These people complaining that they don't, you know, they're, they're being mistreated in their rights. They should have less rights. And I said, you know how many people in Tent City are convicted? Well, all of them! No. 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 A lot more, a, a good percentage of the people in Tent City out there in 118 degrees in the summer with no no fans, nothing. They are waiting for trial. So, they're waiting for trial. See, the plebes, we, you know, they, that's, they live by these BS, right? Whatever, the things that would get us sent to, to prison do not apply to the ruling class. They do not apply to the wealthy. The wealthy just pay a fine. So, speaking of the ruling class, let me get back to why I tentatively titled the show today, I'm just an elected official. Now, again, this is a very nice woman. Uh, Tom's saying, you had a conversation with someone from the mob and she was nice. Wow, so you didn't get your kneecaps broken, but at least she was nice. Well, consider that I'm saying she's nice because, you know, and, and I'm going to treat her with respect because she's not overtly violent and she's not even threatening violence. Yes, it's a criminal organization, but I'm dealing with somebody who's not in, uh, maybe necessarily even aware of that. And if I'm working to resolve a property tax matter, it doesn't do me any good 
and it doesn't help resolve the problem by treating her as if she is, you know, as a member of a criminal organization. I want to treat her with the respect that I want because I'm trying to resolve a problem. Somebody has been damaged very badly by this organization, and I'm not going to go in there and and uh, and, and be a, you know and be a jerk to them. You don't get you don't really resolve these problems by being a jerk. She was a nice woman. Violence never even comes into play, or ethics never even comes into play when you're dealing with the violent ruling class. Ethics comes into play for me. I'm still going to act ethical. Because remember, even if I'm going to be having to defend myself, use defensive force, that is still ethical. So the ethics is still on my side. Anyway, let me get to this. And for those who want to uh, call the show, it's 218-632-9399. 218-632-9399. Ethics are out the window with them chumps. Yeah, but the thing is, not every, not every, most bureaucrats that I've encountered, they don't look at it this way. Yeah, I'm going to talk about the State Department two-step with the IRS. These people, you're right, ethics are meaningless to these people. But the, not the woman that I spoke to the other day. I've spoken with some bureaucrats, and we've gotten a lot of things accomplished because we treat them with respect, and we should. We had to be ethical. We had to be professional. And it's no different. With this woman, she is a gatekeeper. She may be able to resolve this. And she hasn't done anything, anything, to say that she should be treated anything less than, with, than professionally in the way I want to be treated. So I... I walk her through the process. And for those who are new to the show, you want to know, look, aside from always being ethical and treating them the way you want to be treated, but you want to resolve the problem with them, you have to have some point of agreement as your starting point. So I start off always the same. I let her know that we're having an issue with the department. And we want to know what, you know, and then we want to get to the issue. So being that she is a county commissioner, she is the chairman of this county commission. That I want to know, I want to get her agreement first. She agrees. You guys do operate under the presumption that if somebody with their property is physically in California or that part of California, then your laws apply giving jurisdiction to, uh, let's say, uh, assess and collect the tax. And she, yeah, yeah, I believe that's the way it works all over, everywhere. I got to agree with you. That, that's, the, that, that's the operating presumption. So once we know what the operating presumption is, now we can start attacking it. We can start challenging it. That's what I mean by attack. I'm just saying we're asking questions. And so I said, well, do you have any actual facts that would prove that just because my property or I'm physically in California at your constitution and laws apply, giving you jurisdiction to assess and collect the tax? And she chuckled a bit. She says, well, I'm just an elected official. I, I'm not a lawyer, and I, I couldn't even begin to, you know, to, to answer a question like that. So I wrote it down. Take a... I take notes. She she agrees she can't prove the county's claim. So she agrees with it. She personally can't prove the county's claim. So I think this is a pretty good place to be. I mean, you've got the chairman of the county admitting she she can't prove the county's claim because she's not a lawyer. But, you know, this is something that she's doing every day. So she is working on behind the scenes there to get me to the, you know, to the right, if she's not the right uh, district supervisor to speak to, she will get to it. And we'll try to work it out with the elected official because uh, she had said, well, have you gone to, have you gone to the, the tre yeah, we've gone to the treasure. She's the problem. She is the problem here. Oh, she says, well, I can't, I can't tell an, another elected official what to do. I'm like, that may actually be true, but you can pro but being that you're the county commissioner, you can resolve a problem that she caused because the county you know that your agency your 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 organization 
took this man's money. And you certainly are in a position to ensure that that money is returned. So she's going to work on it. She's going to work. That's the most we can ask for right now. So we'll see. And I'll keep everybody updated regarding what happens there. But we're off to a good start. Now, I mentioned the State Department two-step and the lack of ethics that you get with the IRS. So this is something that happened last week. And and I I may if I have the time go through and it may be it, this I think is worth if I could find the time to do this um, I have to edit I have to find where in several hours of audio this is uh, but multiple calls to the Internal Revenue Service over the course of a little more than a week and boy these freaking people oh these people if you've never called the IRS to resolve a problem. One, I'm very envious of you. If you if you have called them, then I I I think we feel for each other because it it is it it is frustrating by design. You're talking about an organization with hundreds and hundreds of departments, and according to my research and what I've been told by Treasury agents. There is no database of contact numbers for the Internal Revenue Service that each department will tell you they cannot contact another department. I, so when you call the main number, which really sucks, you, if they Say that they're not in a position to help you with your problem. Let's say they're looking for a tax return. They'll send you to another department. And more than half the time, it's not the right department. So what they did was they insisted we had to go to balance due. And we say, but wait a minute. There is no balance due. Because all they're doing is looking for a tax return. We have a dispute whether there's an obligation to, to file a tax return. Nope. You got to go to balance due. So we wait on hold sometimes for an hour. To get told to go to a department that's not the right department. And we know it's not the right department. But we go anyway. So then we spend 40 minutes on hold. And, and you know, and, and they tell us. Oh, you've got to go to this department, or you've got to go to tax law. Oh, and tax laws, they, 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 they shut the office down at this time of the year. So we eventually get to somebody who tells us and confirms for us, yes, you were being given wrong information. No. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. We know they were able to confirm that we were misled. So we try to get a stay at proceedings and say, look, we don't want this to escalate to when they file a return for him because it'll just, it, 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 the more it escalates, the more difficult it is for us to get this resolved. And now I understand that. So, and this has nothing to do with my client. This, you, you just admitted that we have been misled by, the, by, by your associates. Misled for a week. Please, we need to stay at proceedings on him. They won't do it. They keep saying they, they, they can't do that. And I've done it, I don't know how many dozens. There are dozens of us! Uh, we've done this so many times. Yes, that's right, there are dozens. So, we have to wait for a supervisor callback. We'll see what happens there. But that, that is where, that's a big difference than when you're dealing with the IRS and when you're dealing with some fairly rural county commissioner. Even the IRS, you're going to treat them with respect because you're trying to resolve this problem. We have to always have the high ground. Why give them any reason to say that you, they will, you will be, oh, he's just some, he just wants to be argumentative. He just wants to be contentious. He, well, that would be the, yeah. Uh, yeah, and if they've got anything in there that is actually true, that yeah, they're going to use it against you, and you're not going to be able to resolve your problem. 
So that's the State Department two-step. Nobody wants to take responsibility for the, uh, the, 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 for the IRS. The claim is absolutely true. But nobody wants to take responsibility for it. Nobody will want, does, wants to answer any questions regarding that. Oh, but it's absolutely true. It's, it's so absolutely true that even questioning us, questioning us is a frivolous argument. Yes, a question of evidence is a frivolous argument. Thinking their claim needs evidence. Frivolous argument. Mark, just the fact that you think that they need evidence to prove their claim. Frivolous. No. Nah. There was something I want to... Uh, where is it? Is the individual individual morally obligated to do what he personally views as wrong in order to obey the law? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. Yeah, and one of the things that I've said, uh, this Shoshana, uh, always communicate in a way that you have a written written record of it. Uh, what I what I like is don't communicate anything that you don't want, you know you know, written up and, and, and shown to you to your face in an interrogation room or on the witness stand. We have to maintain the high road. We're the ethical actors. We're the moral ones. People call government or not. So it's, it's, it's one of the things we're looking at here, too, is we're showing the bad faith, that they're proceeding against you knowing they don't have a case. So now... We've got for this supervisor, this county supervisor, I have uh, now on record, she can't prove it. And I've already discussed this. I even told her, look, we've tried going and getting with, with the legal counsel. Your own treasurer doesn't want to speak to me without counsel present. And then they never set it up. Eh, maybe you can set up a meeting with your treasurer and, and counsel. I'm more than ha I, hey hey, I'm more than happy to do that. Uh, uh, there's I have no problem confronting tax officials, because not one single tax official, not one, has ever ever been able to support their case. In fact, not more times than often, they admit that they don't have to prove it. Uh, somebody's saying here, I'll edit it down for you, Mark. No, it's an IRS call. There's personal information in there, and so I can't release those calls to anybody. So it's just one of them damn things. So uh, let me you make me put the cones on. That's also good about uh, one of the things about the benefits of, of doing the show and just being on the podcast uh, stream on uh, LRN. Uh, I don't have to use the, 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 micro, the, the headset most of the time because... Uh, there's no feed to listen to. So, uh, he's been on the show before. I hope he's got some good news for me over here. We've got Mac from Vancouver, BC. Welcome to the big show. Hey, Mark. Thank you very much. Wow. <sighs> yeah, well, welcome back to the show. I had to just, I had to just uh, adjust your audio there. But uh, you got good news for me today. <laughs> Do I have... Not yet. I got a jaywalking court happening on Wednesday. Jaywalking? I don't have jaywalking, yeah, under the Motor Vehicle Act here in British Columbia. That's not a $4,000 fine, is it? That's $110, $109. No points on the driving record, but it's absolutely ridiculous that I, I don't want to pay it. It's just uh, a couple of motorcycle cops, uh, you know, being... What do you call them? Just being pirates, you know, thugs, tyrants, flexing their muscle. Jeez. Yeah, I, uh, Jaywalk. I didn't cross at a crosswalk. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't cross at a crosswalk. I parked my car. There was no traffic. It was a red light, and I'm going uh, the one direction, so the traffic that obviously my side wasn't coming so i crossed over there's an island there and then on that side of the island there were a bunch of cars waiting at the red light and i went through the cars and the cop yelled at me or i don't know what he said i, I guess he said use the crosswalk and i just kind of 
across the street, street and threw up my arms, and then that was enough cause for them to come over and <laughs> decide to uh, extort money from me. Ah, uh, these so bastards. I've got, I've got a bunch of... Sorry, go ahead. i just saying there are a bunch of bastards, and I got a tech issue. For some reason, none of the uh, caller's audio is going out over the air. So, uh, but, w- but what Mac is related to me, everybody, and this will all be in the podcast, so it's a good thing I'm pulling down this, uh, this particular video. Uh, just a bunch, a, a number of, it's jaywalking in, in BC, uh, and uh, just a, uh, a couple of motorcycle cops who had nothing better to do, so. Um. Yeah, so anyways, I've got a bunch of stuff like that. Uh, the other case I had from, uh, you know, last month, uh, about three weeks ago, that's, uh, I have to file another motion to dismiss, um, on that because that's back in July 12th with a different judge. Um, but the reason I called today is what do you think of like, you know, like I've heard some other, other people do similar things that you're doing in, uh, you know, questioning jurisdiction. <laughs> Etc. And these tra- uh, traffic courts, um, you know, some people are saying they they give invoices. Uh, you know, they bring an invoice to court. Uh, what's your experience and thoughts on that? Um, also, I remember hearing somebody they they start off when they get in front of the the judge or JP saying, you know, am I entitled to a fair and impartial trial or hearing? You know, per, uh, in these proceedings, and also. Before starting any kind of arguments, asking the judge or JP to be like, is jur- jurisdiction an element of of this, uh, you know, charge? So, so you can back them in the corner that way, have them answer yes to that. And is that uh, kind of a better way to go before starting any arguments or talking about the motion to dismiss? All right. Well, I... I, I... The uh, the invoice one. So what the caller, what what Mac is asking about, he's heard some other people do uh, similar things. Uh, well, the last part of what what you said is similar to what I do. It's actually you know what I used you know what I it was in the script. So it comes directly from uh, the work that I've done. Uh, the first one, but bringing in an invoice. Yeah, I think if you want to go to jail or you want to be uh, correctly labeled as a sovereign or a sovereign citizen or a freeman on land type. Uh, that's a good way to do that. I see absolutely no merit to that whatsoever because usually what that entails is to then, uh, when you don't get your $65 trillion, it's, it's usually the, the amount of money that people ask for on it. Like, well, I charge $150,000 an hour. I'm like, oh, come on. Even if there was any legitimacy to this stupid thing, $150,000 an hour, come on. I mean, it, 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 it's, that's what, this stuff is just ridiculous on its face. So I would not do anything like that because, again, it usually is, is followed up with a lien against the agent and, and that, that is, that, that'll get you labeled a paper terrorist. And, and then, you know, you can get, you can be prosecuted pretty, pretty uh, badly for that. So I would definitely not do the invoice stuff. I think that stuff is ridiculous. And I think anybody peddling that, really needs to examine and anyone who's interested in that needs to look at it, what kind of merit there is to that what's the logic behind that and has it ever been successful and and um, even if there is some logic behind it i don't think anybody can show that there's been any success with that as far as going in and asking if you're going to get a fair hearing and then asking if jurisdiction is an element of the charge i think those are great however we generally don't have that much time and so I, while I will review and role play with that kind of stuff, when I go into court, I'm, 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 I want to just go right for the throat. So when they ask me if I'm ready to proceed, I will say, well, uh, objection, the, uh, there's a motion to dismiss pending. Uh, has, you know, has the prosecution uh, met their burden of proof on uh, jurisdiction? And that's the way I would take it. I would keep my focus completely on the prosecutor's burden of proof. Uh, again, these other things, and I've gone into court and I've said that, and it's been effective, and it is, provided you have the time to be able to do that. And most of the time, I would just, I, I would err on the side of caution in that I would always assume I don't, just like I assume that everything they say is a lie, I will assume that I don't have more than a couple of minutes to get this done. Okay. I mean, 
that makes sense. It's just because last time, uh, three weeks ago, when I, after my motion to dismiss, he just threw it away frivolously and said this has no legal standing. I tried to ask, well, is jurisdiction, uh, you know, an element of this charge? And all he would say is, I've already ruled on that. I said, well, I just, you know, it's a yes or no. Is jurisdiction an element of this charge? And he started getting more intimidating, uh, started being in, more intimidating towards me and wouldn't answer like yes or no, because I think that would be kind of grounds of grounds for appeal. Because if he makes a legal, uh, ruling that jurisdiction is or is not an element of the charge, uh, that might have some kind of standing later on if there's an appeal, rather than he was just saying, I dismiss your, your motion, move on. I dismiss your motion, I already ruled on that. But he wouldn't answer that direct question as far as jurisdiction being an element of the charge. Um, because he's kind of forcing me to go ahead now and telling me my motion to dismiss is is no good. He's dismissed it. Of course, um, I did take the opportunity. He did give me the opportunity, like I said, to um, uh, ask for another judge or JP. So I'm just wondering what's going to happen the next time around in July when I go up there and I filed another motion to dismiss and if the same thing happens where they're just going to toss it aside and try to intimidate me into into uh, this hearing. Well, I, and, I remember um, that I remember you mentioning that and – uh, I think what I said at the time was I would have brought something out directly from the case. It would have been like, so uh, when the court ruled in, I, I can't remember the name of the case, that uh, uh, you know, a, a valid cause of action was necessary, that, uh, that, that, that's not legal anymore? You know, as, uh, you know, the question you asked is fine, but I would have been more direct. It would have been more difficult for him. It would have been more obvious to uh, people watching and maybe a reviewing court that he, that he, was, gonna, that he was lying. Obviously, the the arguments in the motion to dismiss or the application to dismiss are based are legitimate legal arguments. Now, you okay. can agree or disagree with whether uh, there's merit in this application of it, but to say it's not legal is just lying. And and that's uh, so. Uh, would that is is that something that would have teeth on appeal? Uh I wouldn't give it that much credit. I, you know, I think it's a great issue. I don't think a reviewing court's going to give it much weight. I, I think that, you know, that. It, oh, okay. I, I would still raise it. I, I, but I think the, the, the weight, the arguments that I, the legal arguments that I raise on appeal that, that, that have weight to them, and get the whole thing tossed out would be, let's say, a lack of, of a, uh, of a effective cross examination, denial of effective cross. That to me is the bread and butter of the appeal. And, and I, but I still would raise the, you know, I, I would still raise that issue. Okay. Yeah. No, I got to go back and listen to that show and make notes because you said some good things there. And I haven't had, uh, you know, before I, before the next date, I do need to listen back to that because I can't memorize all the information that you give out. It's a lot of information. Well, I'll cover um, some of the basics go, too, and when you know, a, a, you know, after you know, after the call, so that I, you know, I'll finish the show off with that, and so we'll have a little more information there. Because, I, again, I apologize; I have no idea. Uh, people, you know, I, I don't, I, unless the 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 audio for the stream is coming directly from my webcam by mistake. That's the only thing I can think of why the caller line is not going out. But the caller is being recorded on my end, so it'll be part of the podcast. So. Perfect. Um, so, you know, just getting back to the invoice thing, yeah, you know, $150,000 an hour is ridiculous, but something like, you know, in my other business, I do charge $100 an hour, let's just say, if I do get like, give private lessons or things like that. You know, I think the argument somebody made was like, you know, if I'm entitled to a fair uh, and impartial, you know, to be treated fairly impartially in these proceedings, well... It's like the judge is getting paid, the police officer is getting paid, everybody's getting paid, except us who have to go and answer to these frivolous charges. We're sacrificing our life and our time and taking yeah. time off work to go deal with it. So how can that be? The argument there is how can that be? How are we treated fairly? You know, if that's the case here, we're kind of forced to come and participate in this and we're the ones losing money while everybody else is getting a paycheck. 
I yeah, I agree with wanting to get my you know get my you know damages. Uh, you know, we had Helen in England who got costs awarded you know against the prosecution for essentially wasting her time. And I just wouldn't do it with the judge or the prosecutor. I would file a claim for damages. Uh, let's say how much of the time it cost me to do this. To add up what uh, you know the time it took to defend all the time it took to defend against this, and I would file a claim for damages against the insurance. I wouldn't file an invoice with the judge. That's not going to go anywhere. Uh, but, I, you know, possibly, you know, I'd take a claim for damages against the judge. I mean, uh, for what the judge and prosecutor did and the cop. Uh, take it to the to the city or the county risk management. And then if, if they uh, denied it, I'd take it into small claims. Okay. Yeah. Take that avenue. Yeah, that sounds good. Well, I'll talk more about the basics um, af af after uh, after you uh, after the call. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we're not allowed to record in court. I mean, the cop even warned me beforehand. He goes, you know, you're going to get in a lot of trouble because I had a... I've always reported my encounters with the police initially. Uh, you know, the cop uh, a few weeks ago warned me, don't have a camera or recording in the court or you're going to get charged. So, I don't know what kind of secrets these guys are trying to hold in, you know, you know, in court that we're not allowed to record them, and then we got to go buy transcripts off them if there's any sure. appeal, anything like that. For they want the money, they want your money. They're gonna so they figure even if you win on appeal, they're gonna get money out of you somewhere, some somehow. They want the money, and I don't know how it is in Canada exactly, but if if uh, out here in in this part of North America, the rules do allow for us to record uh, court proceedings. However, the discretion is left to each judge. So uh, you, most of the time, these the, 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 these crooks just they don't allow it. Uh, in New Hampshire, for example, you can go in, anybody from as far as I know, you, anybody could just bring a camera even into the Supreme Court, which got to tell you, nice, nice. You know this? Yeah, there's never actually. I think there's only one known photograph of the of the U.S. Supreme Court sitting. And uh, so somebody uh, risked going to prison uh, to do that. But uh, find out what the rules allow. And if you want to record it, unfortunately, yes, you're going to have to let the judge know, I plan on recording this. Then he can issue an order allowing you or an issue an order uh, prohibiting you from doing that. Okay. And if I do happen to record it, like, and if I send it to you, like, you'd keep that confidential, right? And just for your information, just to see when, uh, what, what went on in the proceedings. Oh, uh, yeah. If, if people send me things all the time. It. Yeah. If, I, if somebody sent it to me, yeah, uh, there was a recording that I would have, I, I, I had permission to actually post it, but I didn't because I, uh, my channel, although it's a small channel, uh, does have a lot more uh, subs. Uh, I I chose not to, and he won that case. He yeah he won, uh, but he had uh, there was some uh, discussion with the judge that was recorded, and I heard it, and I've reported it on the show. I just made the choice to protect him, uh, and just report it and not do that. So yeah, I I I would not I would not post anything without permission. Awesome. All right, I'll uh, wrap. I'll let you wrap up here. Uh, your thoughts here, and I'll listen in, and I'll call back another day. All right, appreciate the call, Mac in BC. Uh, we have to assume that everything they're saying is a lie. That is a sound defense tactic. Assume if their lips are moving, or if they've written something, it's a lie. You got to challenge it. You got to object. You got to challenge it. Um, it. It has served me well, and. And, and more, a lot of people have reported that one of the most important pieces of, of information regarding how to defend yourself in court, the one that he thought or she thought was the most valuable, was assuming that what they're saying is a lie, object and have them verify it. That which can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. And and jurisdiction is an issue of fact, no matter how many times they lie about it. Issue of fact. Oh, that criminal. In New Hampshire. 
Jurisdiction is a pure issue of law. It requires no evidence to prove it's true. The only thing the prosecution has to do is prove that you're physically here in New Hampshire. That is the best, I think, these legal scholars, these, these lawyers, the ones with the advanced university degree, how they'll make fun of us. You're just an internet lawyer. Well, you know what? I don't make arguments that are so contradictory. I, 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 like, But, you know, I think he knows it's contradictory, but he can say that because he has a small army behind him. He could just have you thrown in jail for contempt. All right, we got time for one call because, again, this is a commercial-free broadcast. I am taking care of, of family, so I'm not doing a, a marathon three-hour session. I'm not even going to do a two-hour session today. Uh, but I'm going to take one more call and then uh, pull the plug on this, and, and which is, on again, we're all, all the audio is going to be in the podcast. So we got home bumming it here. Hey, how's it going, Mark? Yeah, you know, Sorry all things. about your situation. Yeah, and I'm and I'm in California too, so I gotta be stuck over. Here. You know what? I, I I I know this happens in Arizona also, but the degree of the garbage. I mean, I I get into town. It's 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 uh, was it Thursday night, and and I gotta get a couple of things for my my child at the store, and, and I you know I, I I pull in, I open up the door, and and it's this thing that. People just open their car door and, and take a bag of garbage, you know, like fast food, and just 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 leave it there. And it's like that through the whole parking lot. Dirty diapers. I love the dirty diapers, don't you? Oh, somebody posted on Reddit the other day. It was a picture of someone in a restaurant changing a diaper on the table. Wow. I I, I, I eat there next. <laughs> I, 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 just, yeah, but you're right. I, I know to the, some of the people who work at a store around the corner for me, and and it's and they say, well, Mark, the garbage. I, I, I'm happy with the garbage compared to what they, people leave dirty diapers in the. They leave a dirty diaper in the cart. Yeah. <sighs> uh, I, I, I'm sorry. I'm, 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 I'm talking. It's not even necessarily relevant. It's relevant in a way to what we, to the topic of the show. But <laughs> what, what did you have well, for us today? San Bernardino, you know that that's that's like the most ghetto place in, uh, in, uh, uh, I want to say the East County. Uh, but there so are nice I parts of San Bernardino. Wondering. We'll say that again. I'm sorry. We'll just take a moment to go because I don't have a top of the hour break anymore. There are nice parts here. Look, where I am, and I'm off oh, of... Oh, no. There are great parts. Yeah. I'm off of Waterman. I, I can give that much information. I'm off of Waterman in 330 over here, okay? So to give some people some context. On the other side of Waterman is a, uh, a community, a small community. It's old, but it's nice. And they have the golf course there. And and there are houses on either side of the golf course because you know it, and 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 it's it's a beautiful area, and 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 the more you go up the mountain, the more expensive the houses get, and so that's still San Bernardino, and so that part's nice, but yeah, down here on Waterman and Fortieth, oh no, it, it's just like well, it's just like L.A. where you got Malibu is like really nice and it's all mansions and gated community and stuff, and then you go a mile away into L.A. and it's just uh, you know it, it's nasty. It's yeah, it was all get out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like you said, I think it's the the fact that the people that can afford the gated communities, like you said, they don't. They can afford to not care. And the people that are struggling or stressed out and they're just like, screw it, I'm going to just do whatever. And uh, they don't have, uh, I think they have you know, different stresses in life and, and they're, they're taking it out in their own way, I guess, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, somebody will get paid to, to clean this, you know, they figure or something like that. Uh I don't know. I honestly don't know. People suck. I wanted to ask you. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, they do. They do. 
Right? Yeah. I, it's not the bear. It's not the bear sitting in the woods that's screwing up the world. It's us. You know, that's the truth of it. What I'm wondering is, that, have you ever gone ahead and actually had an experience where someone was able to turn it around and take it to civil court? And actually get something out of it. Well, uh, there are people that have sued cops, yeah. Uh, as far as someone that I personally work with, uh, no. But I mean, I know people like Mark Victor who have been, you know, have clients that have been brutalized by cops and go into civil court and have success. Now, that happens. Yeah. That does happen. Yeah. You, you, yes, there have been successful many successful civil actions against the police and uh, even the irs there are some that even the irs agents have had to pay yeah my, my mother just passed on the fifth and we're going oh, through probate good and, lord um, oh man having a hard time actually pursuing my civil case uh because i'm just so out of it and distracted I, and my, uh oh man so do, you know, I, I mean, I'm not going after the cops. I'm going after the store managers. Oh, well, I, for those who can't hear what you're saying, Home Bum and its mom passed away this week. No, not this week. It was a couple weeks ago. Oh, a couple weeks ago. Some, okay. All right. All right. A couple yeah. weeks ago. I, 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 okay. Beginning of the month. That sucks, man. I, anyway. Well, you know, it was, I think it's a kind of, it, it's a double whammy between her and my sister. I mean, half my family just died in the last two years, so <laughs> it's not, oh. uh, yeah, stressful. Anyway, um, so there is that. And then Project Veritas won a case in the 5th Federal District uh, that the court said that a, um, a citizen, somebody can, uh, uh, secretly record a public official in their duties that it's, it's, you know, it's part of the First Amendment. So, cause that's what they do. They specialize in secret recordings and then catching people saying stuff that's really like damning. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so they were suing for the right to do that in Massachusetts, I believe. And they won the case. I think you're right about that. Yeah, Massachusetts. Of all places, Massachusetts. Right. So, um, yeah, because I looked it up. You know, I was curious about it because I definitely went into court with a, a body cam and recorded the uh, end of the uh, uh, my um, competency hearing. And, you know, that's online. And I'm not getting in trouble for that. And I'm pretty sure that everybody was saw the, the you know the camera on there i mean it wasn't i wasn't hiding it but um nobody said anything and i just figure if they're not going to say anything i'm not going to ask so uh but yeah that's that's what i was thinking was uh you know uh i i personally i i just don't feel comfortable being around them and not recording Hey, you know, I, uh, I, that that's a it, that's not a paranoia. You know, too much happens. Uh, you know, if you're not if you're not rich, if you're not wealthy, we all run the risk of being hurt by the cops. That you know, that's the way they're trained. They're trained to see us all as threats. You know, it's the the, the stop and frisk crap that they did in New York City, which was shown to target you know non-white people who weren't rich and white, rich or white. If you're rich and white, yeah, and you got some, yeah, you 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 got it going on. No, um, yeah, man, I, I I can't even get past. I I just feel. I mean, I'm going through my own thing here, and 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 I just telling me that your your mom passed away a few weeks ago. I can't even. I, maybe we could yeah, talk. We're about in town. It. You should do lunch, man. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe we'll have to we'll have to talk about legal stuff on another show. I I I think I've I've had my fill. I I feel terrible. That that is awful. I mean, my mother passed well, away uh, just, seven years ago. But uh, I I yeah, it, it, it's you know it, it's uh that sucks. Well, you know what? I'll be doing this show yeah. on Wednesday. Why don't we we spend? You know, I'll have my audio fixed, and we can do a bit better of a of a job on the show. 
I got a I, I got a car now and a driver's license and you know I'm probably going to be somewhat uh, like in the system. <laughs> you know, I'll I'll actually appear on paper from something else other than an arrest record. So right. you know, I'll, yeah. Uh, right. Well, we'll talk more about the civil action on the next show. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. I mean, I I still have. <laughs> I got to file an extension. I got to do it before the second, I believe. And, um, you know, because I'm running out of time and I just can't think on it. So uh, I just wanted to ask, you know, do you think it would be, I, I personally, I think it's worth pursuing just for the fact to go ahead and make a ruckus of it. Um, I heard recently of some civil case being uh, kicked back or, or having a, uh, effect on the criminal uh, courts when they found out that there was prosecutorial misconduct involved, which there definitely is. There's even false statements on the police reports in my situation, you know, where you could see it from the video footage that that would never happen. So, you know, they were mischaracterizing me in the in the police report. So I'm wondering, you know, I mean, it's got to be worth it. There's got to be something there that I could go ahead and push and get them to, uh, you know, kind of go, oh, wow, this could fire back on us if we do stuff like this. Yeah, you know? I, mean, I, some... I, I, I like the idea of being able to get it, the, the Brady cops and getting it broadcast. So especially if it comes out in a deposition, it comes out in court, in civil court, about how dishonest the cop and prosecutor were. If you can make that known and get that information out to the defense lawyers in the area, then that can that could have an impact. Uh, it certainly gives grounds to a defense lawyer who is having problem getting Brady material on a police officer because California is horrendous for Brady material. Uh, but if you've if they've got a deposition, they've got something from another court case, let's say yours, that they can use. They could do an in camera. Uh, interview with the judge and say, this is our cause. This is our evidence to get into this guy's file. So it may, yeah, it very well could have an impact if you can get the information to uh, local defense lawyers. So. Uh, they well, don't really talk to me anymore. <laughs> uh, okay, well, look, you, you'll have to get with me, get with me off, uh, off air, or email me, so, and then we can take care, you know, answer some questions here, and then call them to the next show when we've got your audio going on, on the stream, okay? Yeah, absolutely, man. All right. I, I can't thank you enough for your work and your help and uh, uh, the community, too. I want to thank all the guys for helping me out. I appreciate it. Guys. Well, they'll they'll hear that on the podcast, but I'll let them know. I appreciate the call. I got to let you go. Uh, home bombing it, just uh, letting everyone know that he does appreciate the community and the, and the help that people have given. And uh, I, again, my heart goes out to him and anybody who's gone going through a situation like this where a loved one is is, is sick and in the decline, uh, whether they're with cancer or advanced age, like what I'm dealing with. Uh, it, it, that, that's, that, that, that just sucks. So I, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I know I had spoken to Mac, uh, I, so I, I'll just, I'll just do, uh, some of the basics, uh, that you need to review when we get on discord and, uh, and on Skype and do role playing. Everything that they say is a lie when you're going in to defend yourself, when you're doing an investigation. So it's before and, and, and during court. When you're doing an investigation into these issues, assume that everything they're saying is a lie and challenge it all. Always get their position, though, especially when we're talking with a prosecutor or a tax agent because they, they are so damn dishonest and they never want to give straight answers. They don't want to be held accountable for what they say. They always want to kick it to somebody else. Prosecutors just want you to talk to the judge because they know the judge has their back, you know? Uh, so we assume that everything they say is a lie. We've got to have the proof. And you're asking leading questions. Leading questions have the information in the question. And don't take for a second when people say your, your, your question is an argument. Even if they go back and they say, well, here's Mark Stevens himself saying, put your accusation in the form of a question. It's a tactic. It's how we 
ask our questions. It's a way, all I'm saying there is, it's, 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 a, it, it's how we frame good questions. It doesn't change the fact that you're asking a question. Asking somebody for their facts is never an argument. It is not argumentative. Any, only an idiot would think that if you ask somebody a question, did you uh, determine X? And they say yes. And then you say, well, what facts did, did, did you rely on to, 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 to support X? To turn around and say that that question asking for facts is an argumentative question because only an idiot would think that. And I get tired of seeing those stupid comments. I understand, and, and most of us understand that, yes, you can have an argumentative question. You killed him, didn't you? That could be argued to be an argumentative question. But asking somebody for the facts their claim is based on is never argumentative. That is just the height of arrogance and stupidity. And sometimes it's, it's a combination of the two. Especially if you think that somebody else is too stupid to see through that tactic. And if you ask somebody for the facts that their claim was based on, you are absolutely not asking for an opinion, and you are not asking for a legal conclusion. They're lying to you. So that some of you have to come up, you, you assume that everything is a lie. Because chances are, if it's a bureaucrat, chances are they are lying. Just like at the start of the show. This prosecutor said they wanted to treat this, this former state representative like any other person. Sure. Sure. Oh, yeah, I believe you. Everything is a lie. I uh, appreciate everyone tuning in. <laughs> uh, the audio level's better. Remember, I had to bring everything out here to California. I will have this video pulled down. I will have audio only. I'll have all the, 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 the caller's audio will all be intact. I got the good recording going over here, so I don't know what happened. But I appreciate everyone tuning in on this weekend, uh, Memorial Day weekend. Uh, and uh, I appreciate the continued support of the show. So if um, you'd like to be able to support the show, it's uh, markstevens.net or markstevens.sales.net. Um, and uh, I should be live on the Wednesday broadcast. And so, uh, whatever I miss, whoever I miss today, I apologize, and I will be back on Wednesday live, probably from the Fortify compound here in California. But uh, hey, till then, salud.